Welcome to the Navy Memorial SITREP Speaker Series, and glad to have you joining us today. Before we get started, I'm proud to announce that the Navy Memorial is back. We are open. We've reopened the doors in March to the public, and uh, the great news is the, uh, the, the public are coming, and uh, we, we're getting a lot of veterans, a lot of active duty folks coming through the Navy Memorial, uh, so I kind of feel like we're, we're on our way back after uh, two years of a pandemic. So uh, today's program, as you all know, uh, is live online. Uh, it's available to the public all around the country. And uh, we kind of focus on naval and what we call naval enthusiasts. So we're glad you were able to join us today. As you know, the Navy Memorial uh, Sit Rep Series uh, is, brings together Navy leaders uh, with the idea to keep the, uh, the country informed about what is going on uh, inside, inside our Navy. As you can see on the platform, you can ask questions on the platform. I've got a, a pad here next to me, a tablet next to me, and I'll be checking out the questions. And if you like a question, hit like, and the, one that get, the ones that get the most likes float to the top, and I'll be checking out the questions and getting your questions uh, into the flow of the program today. We're honored today uh, to have as our guest the first commander of the Navy Safety Command, uh, Rear Admiral Fred uh, Luckman. And before we get there, though, I want to thank our sponsors. You know, we could not do what we do without our sponsors. Our sponsors today are Navy Mutual Aid uh, and Navy Mutual Aid Life Insurance, who provides affordable life insurance and annuities to those who serve or have served our nation. And our second uh, series co-sponsor this year is Dell Technologies, who provides end-to-end -end technology solutions and digital transformation accelerators to their clients. Again, we could not do what we do uh, without their sponsorship. So it's my honor to introduce the first commander of the Navy's newly named Safety Command, Rear Admiral Fred Luckman, known to his friends as Lucky, a career F-18 Hornet and Super Hornet pilot. He's commanded at the squadron and the wing level. He's a Top Gun graduate. And quite frankly, he's, I could list the operations that he's been involved in, but I think it's fair to say he's been involved in every operation, major operation that the United States Navy has been involved in since the 90s, accumulating about 4,000, more than 4,000 flight hours and uh, more than 1,000 uh, arrested carrier arrested landings. So Admiral Luckman, it's a, it's a real pleasure for us to host you here today. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Frank. And, and uh, I have to say it is indeed a high honor for me to be here today. This is a tremendous opportunity for me to speak about the work that's going on at the Naval Safety Command on behalf of sailors and Marines throughout the fleet and, and an opportunity really to thank you as well for all the work that you and the foundation does here for sailors across the world. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And, and, uh, and, and more importantly, thank you for doing what you're doing. <laughs> uh, so let me, let's jump right in though. So uh, most of us are familiar with the Naval Safety Center. Um, we lived through it throughout our careers. Uh, it's kind of been a mainstay, uh, but a big shift here, a uh, big announcement the Navy makes uh, and the Naval Safety Center is going to become the Naval Safety Command. Um, what does that, that name change? What does this mean to change from the Safety Center to the Safety Command? Yeah, and there's a, there's a lot to that, Frank. And as you kind of intimated, the Naval Safety Center was established originally in 1951 as the Naval uh, aviation safety activity. Yeah. Uh, it's always had an aviator uh, at, at the controls. Um, and while we did later on in its history take on uh, uh, responsibility for safety management across the fleet, there's always been a little bit of an aviation focus there. So there's a couple of elements to this name change, I think. First and foremost is it's a reflection of the Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations uh, emphasis on safety throughout the force. Uh, accompanying that name change is also an elevation in authority and, and also uh, responsibility. So there are some parts about the Naval Safety Center slash command that will not change. Uh, so for example, uh, our investigations branch uh, comprised of sailors and Marines, both uniform and civilian, world-class in my opinion, in doing what they do, that will not change. Uh, safety promotions will not change. We have a fantastic crew that does both online, social media, in print publications, targeting the right message to the right sailor uh, and Marine at the right time. And our analytics piece won't change too drastically. We'll still do 
uh, analytics to, to, to try and identify where the risk is in the fleet and communicate that. But the additional authorities and responsibilities, which I think we're going to get to in, in subsequent questions, that's really the focus of the name change. So you and I were talking a little bit before. <clears throat> it is really more than a name change. I mean, this is, um, this is coming from the CNO's, uh, you mentioned the secretary and the CNO's emphasis on this, and the CNO is, has come out uh, uh, with a campaign, um, get real, get better. Um, you were saying it's part of that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I wouldn't say it's, it's a, uh, a direct part of Get Real, Get Better, but boy, it fits in there really well. Let me explain that a little bit. CNO gave some very compelling remarks at the Surface Navy Association uh, uh, conference in January. And effectively, he laid out the challenge facing the Navy as we go forward into this most compelling decade. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. And we have to perform at our absolute very best across the board. And there are a couple of things that are inhibiting our ability to perform at our very best. And one of them is variability in performance in the fleet. So for example, we have units, uh, activities out there that perform very well consistently, continually, and we wanna capture that uh, and, and, and maintain that level of effort. But we also have areas where we don't get that consistent high level performance. And I think a good example of that is fire on board Bonhomme Richard in 2020. Clearly an example of, of low performance that we need to elevate across the force. So his challenge with respect to get real, get better is a challenge directly uh, uh, aimed at Navy leaders to say, we need to understand our business. We need to self-assess, self-correct and learn and elevate the performance of the entire fleet and thereby eliminate the variability in performance across the fleet. So how does the safety command fit into that? I, I think we're gonna get into some details later, but um, get real, get better, measurement, improvement. Um, uh, you know, quite frankly, safety's always been an emphasis, right? We've always uh, driven at it. So how does the safety command and what you're gonna be doing uh, maybe in more general terms, we're going to get into some specifics, but how does that, how does that help and how does that become part of this uh, get real, get better? Absolutely. I mean, that's a great question. And there are, I think, three elements really that kind of go into answering that. One is not directly related, and that is the fact that we really cleaned up our C2 with the establishment of the Naval Safety Command. So our command yeah, and control, command and control, command and control apologize, okay. yeah. um, is very clean now. I, have, I am a direct report to the Chief of Naval Operations and also uh, a special advisor to the Secretary of the Navy for all matters safety. So that line is very clear. And at the low end of that uh, chain of command, uh, my position will be elevated to a two-star admiral who has experience either in command of an expeditionary strike group or a carrier strike group, thereby giving him greater perspective on all things safety throughout the fleet. So that's the kind of chain of command aspect of it. Internally, we're gonna be focused on uh, the way we assess performance in the fleet. So rather than the, the Naval Safety Center is kind of famous for our assist visits that we would perform mm -hmm. out in the fleet. We mm -hmm. would visit squadrons and ships and submarines installations, activities, provide a lot of really useful information with respect to safety culture and programmatics. However, that information wasn't necessarily aimed at understanding risk and uh, aggregating or understanding the aggregation of that risk across the fleet. So we will now have the ability and the authority to do short notice or no notice inspections across the fleet to evaluate compliance and that focus isn't so much based on we're trying to hammer a commanding officer on a ship or in a squadron because they're not compliant. No, we're trying to understand the effectiveness of the safety management system, and that is a symptom of the effectiveness. Uh, added to the responsibilities for the Naval Safety Command is we are going to assess uh, at all echelons the, the management of their safety management system. So from ESH-2 fleet commanders all the way down through type commanders, uh, system commanders, uh, and our certification events, all of that will be inspected to assess the effectiveness of the safety management system. And then the third part 
that I know this is droning on a little bit, but is that safety management system that I talked about. Um, we are simplifying, streamlining, and aligning our safety management system uh, to do really one thing, and that is to have an open, transparent conversation about risk. So how do we do that? First, we have to identify the risk, then we communicate both up and down the chain, and then we make sure that that risk is held at the right level. And I think that, that's something we'll need to dive into a little bit later on, is that accountability piece. Because when I speak about accountability, I'm not talking about accountability after a mishap, after an event. I'm not talking about blame. I'm talking about the accountability as it relates to risk prior to an event, where we may have some ability to either mitigate or eliminate uh, that risk. So there's a lot of elements to our elevation to Navy Naval Safety Command. I think first and foremost, it's, it's, it's really about understanding risk. Foundationally, and I promise this will be the last point, Frank. Uh, foundationally, um, we are so pleased at the Naval Safety Command to have this emphasis placed on what we do for a living. And regardless of someone's specific job within the Naval Safety Command, they all go to work focused on sailors and Marines. That is our bedrock. That is our granite keystone to everything we do at the Naval Safety Command. And we all kind of tap that on the way in and way out of the building. So we are always focused on the sailor, uh, safety of sailors and Marines. And, and we're excited to have the opportunity to have this conversation so broadly throughout the fleet. So you, you kind of nail, I think, probably what a lot of the folks who are watching are thinking right now is the balance between that accountability and blame and all that. And you, you talked about the safety management system, which I really do want to dive into. If you're out in the fleet today, what, what are the sale, what, are, what are the changes? What, what is the beginning of this entail? Um, the, the beginning of this transition, what does it entail uh, as you go from the center to the command? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think uh, easiest to understand for a sailor in the fleet as they're on their ship or in their squadron. And you're gonna get a team of, of safety professionals from the Naval Safety Command and walk on board. Uh, might be no notice, it could be very short notice, and they're just going to observe. They're looking for compliance. Um, Compliance is, as I talked about, is, is merely an indicator as to the health of the system in which it resides. So they'll observe for compliance and then they're gonna to wanna to have a conversation about why, if there is non-compliance, that non-compliance exists. And it's not to throw blame on that individual sailor or Marine, uh, or even that individual sailor or Marine's chain of command. It's to understand the system in which that action is taking place and what the enterprise has failed to do to support that action. Um, that's a little bit of a harsh way of saying that, but clearly our intent is to send sailors and Marines forward with the proper tools, training, equipment, and supervision to do their job. So if one of those elements is not present and we observe that, we wanna know why. Where in the system could we have done better to make sure that those sailors and Marines are safe in what they're doing and more operationally effective. So again, going back to the balance, right? So what authority, uh, as, as you proceed here and you try to be, uh, the safety command is, is out to assist, uh, what authorities do you, do you have? What, what authorities are available to you to ensure that there's follow on and there's action to what you're doing here? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Laid, laid out very clearly in a memo from the Chief of Naval Operations to me as we established the Naval Safety Command, laid out the authority to go inspect no notice or short, short notice units, but also echelon staffs above, so that we get a good picture of where the risk is and uh, where risk controls uh, need to be implemented. And then uh, a little bit uh, kind of to the side of your question is, how do we assess the effectiveness of the controls that are being implemented? That's a really good question. So by witnessing the culture on board the ship, and then aggregating that data across the fleet, we get a really good idea of what policies, procedures, or practices are effective and which are not. And because of our elevation in status, we can work with entities like the Learning to Action Board, which we may talk about later on, to ensure that those changes that have been made have enduring effect. In fact, 
going back to what we talked about with respect to Get Real, Get Better, that we become a more uh, effective learning organization. So that leads you to go, so, so how, do, how does that uh, translate into change behavior? How, how does what you're doing there get into reducing, uh, or, or quite frankly, to uh, helping with risk management? Um, because it seems like that's what you're really doing. If you're not in the blame part, you're in the, in the minimizing risk or making the right uh, risk decision. Yeah, I think uh, a good way to answer that is, is to take a look at kind of a, uh, a little bit of a historical perspective on mishaps. So, um, and we can go into mishap statistics if you want to. Um, I don't live there very often, to be honest, because uh, quite frankly, Statistics are, are just that, and without perspective of time and space, uh, the value is somewhat limited. Um, but as we took a look at a couple of, uh, uh, more than a decade of mishaps across the Navy, uh, and this is back when we were the Naval Safety Center shortly after I checked on board, we, we evaluated uh, a number of mishaps and we found a number of similar causal factors. Causal factors similar or, 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 or uh, like lack of supervision or, in, or ineffective supervision, ineffective training, um, lack of awareness as to policy procedure that should be in place, and quite frankly, noncompliance. Those were common across this group of mishaps that we looked at. So the challenge is how do we go from an organization that is focused on preventing this one mishap from happening again to an organization that absorbs all of the lessons out of that mishap and applies it broadly across the fleet. And what we convey uh, and what we think is we would rather look to the left of the mishap mm -hmm. and focus on the before the bang, understand the risk that's present, and then try to, try to elevate that to what's that picture look like for the entire fleet and how do we optimize our response to that risk and control that risk so that we're way ahead of the bang instead of trying to reflectively change uh, on the fly after a mishap. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but happy to dive deeper it, into it. It did, and it, it kind of goes, I, th I think, to what we've been trying to do, the Navy's been trying to do for a while, right? Is trying to get ahead of uh, the problem to, to try to, um, so we make this big change, uh, some significant uh, process changes. I want to dive into SMS because there's a little bit of jargon there yeah. and I want to ask you about that. Um, but before I go any farther, I got a question here uh, from the audience that I think it kind of begs where we are, the question, uh, the process where we are today. What's the recent safety record of the Navy compared to, to past decades? It's actually floated all the way to the top. So. Um, before we go any farther, uh, you mentioned Bonham Richard. Yep. There's some, some things that, the, the big ones always end up in the news, sure. right? And to your point, not necessarily looking at data and figures and all that, but how is safety today yeah. so, compared to 10 years, 20 years, or when you came in? Really interesting question. I mean, I could pull out these blue bar charts that we make and they're, you know, we, we drown ourselves in these blue bar charts. Um, and you could focus on this year and you know, for this year so far, you would see the afloat community, ships and submarines, is riding higher than uh, it has in the past few years. You would see aviation is riding a little bit higher. Riding higher means? Hi more mishaps. More mishaps. Okay. Um, you would see recreational down, which is a good news story, especially coming out of COVID. Um, but none of that really means anything because it, they're not out of the norm, the, the, the statistical norm for the past 10 years or for the past 20 years for that matter. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if we see an uptick like we are uh, this year for afloat mishaps, um, is that really an indicator as to where we he are heading or is that statistically within the norm? And it is. And what you see is that we're statistically riding the same curve for 20 and 30 years. So that's what I'm really focused on. I'm not focused on the fact that we had 
X number more mishaps this year than we did last year. That's not necessarily the trend that provides any useful information. What's really useful is we haven't changed. And why is that important? Well, it's important because we spend $1 billion a year on the Navy on mishaps every year, with a B, $1 billion. A billion dollars. A billion mishaps. dollars. What is, it, what is that? In, explain to me what that. Okay, what that so we've uh, we've you know uh, lost aircraft. Got uh, it. All of that adds up to okay. you know the billion. Um, <coughs> you know lo uh, loss of steaming time on ships when there's a mishap, et cetera, et cetera. Got it. Personnel costs are included in that, and it's a rough yep. number, but it's about a billion dollars a year. 2020 is a lot more than that because we struck bottom of chart. Mm -hmm. So. Why am I interested, why am I more focused on the longevity or the long-term look at the statistics is because we're not changing. Even though year to year we get better or worse, we're not changing over the long term. So in order to drive the behavioral change that we think we need to drive, we're focused on creation of this safety management system that you alluded to a little bit earlier. So that takes us back to this SMS yeah. that, that, you know, it, it uh, uh, I know you're an aviator. I know S acronyms roll off the top of your tongue, but it sounds like there's a lot of, of uh, focus on SMS. So can you tell us a little bit about what is the safety, safety management system and, and what is different about that as we move forward? Yeah, so the safety management system is actually quite uh, a, a simple uh, concept. It's, it's a top-down, enterprise-wide framework that allows us to understand the risk that we operate with every day. Uh, the end goal of the safety management system is to come out of that with risk identified and communicated in a transparent ecosystem and then held at the appropriate level. And the accountability piece is absolutely key. Um, and I'll dive a little bit into detail on this. One of the things that we noticed even back as a Naval Safety Center as we were going out for assist visits, is that a lot of risk falls onto the shoulders of our commanding officers out in the fleet. Those uh, 05s, 06s that are running squadrons and ships and submarines uh, activities and installations. Um, and our premise is that unless you have the lever that can control that risk or mitigate that risk, then you really can't own that risk and you got to elevate it. So you could think of examples like manpower or training or that kind of thing. Um, but the safety management system is really all about having an open conversation, get real, about mm -hmm. how we do what we do, and then getting it, the risk to the right level so that it can be controlled. Um, and it's, it, it's beyond the stovepipes of community, of coast, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, it's a full scale understanding of the risk that we operate in every single day. And, and you made a point earlier, it was absolutely true that we do operate with risk every single day in the Navy and Marine Corps, um, every single day. And it's not to say every activity is a high risk activity, but when you consider the amount of days that we steam and the amount of hours that we fly, the types of activities that we do, we really do perform pretty well. But it's those off target incidents like Bonham or Shard, um, like others, that indicate that the system isn't as healthy as it could be um, and that we can do more to understand the risk that's out there in the fleet. And that's the whole reason for the safety management system. So you've used risk management 10 times, I think, in yeah. this conversation. Yeah. Um, it, and it seems to me that's the root of, of the beginning of the of the training part or whatever. So, d so does SMS drive the risk management discussion? Um, SMS is really about risk management and assessing the effectiveness of risk controls. Uh, so, uh, trying to trying to elevate this a little bit, we, I keep focusing on the unit, and this really is about an all enterprise uh, uh, line of effort, but. Um, if we truly understand the risk that's out there, regardless of what that risk is, whether, whether it's personnel or training or tempo, um, if we truly do understand it, then we can have that open dialogue about the best way to mitigate it 
and then use that as a best practice, apply that broadly throughout the rest of the Navy. Um, those mitigations that get put in place to, uh, to reduce that risk are called risk controls. Um, so we should have a very clear understanding of the risk that we're operating in. And if I'm a commander at a staff, my staff ought to have that very same picture and we all ought to be working together to control the risk that we have identified. So hopefully that makes a little bit more that sense. That makes sense. Okay. That, so, so from an uh, individual standpoint, on the deck plates or at Second Fleet or at Fleet Forces Command, that I think you just you painted that picture yeah. of, of the, of course, frankly, the same site picture. Yeah. All right, let's take a quick break. Okay. Um, and uh, we'll take a, uh, about a minute and a half break, and we'll be right back. And when we come back, uh, I'm going to ask Admiral Luckman uh, to tell us a little bit about what went into these changes and, and, and how, how did he come about, uh, what areas did he look at before, he, before they went into making the big change to the safety command. Stay tuned. The people we serve at Navy Mutual are like family. Navy Mutual is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1879, providing life insurance products, service, and education to members of the military service and their families. We understand them because we have served ourselves. Everything we do every day is about serving our members. We treat them like we would treat our family. It's all about the member. We started with computers. We didn't stop at computers. We didn't stop at storage or cloud. We kept going, working with our customers to enable a kind of technology that can guide an astronaut back to safety and help make a hospital come to you instead of you going to it. So when it comes to your business, you know we'll stop at nothing. Welcome back, and uh, we're getting some good questions on the uh, on the platform. Keep them coming. Uh, please make sure uh, you like them, and as you like them, uh, they'll float to the top. We used a couple of them uh, early, and I, I see a couple we're going to try to get into the uh, into the program here uh, as we go. Um, so, so as I mentioned before the break, um, take a step back. What other organizations did you look at? I mean, we like to think that the Navy. Uh, has a monopoly on focusing on safety, right? <laughs> um, what, did you look at other organizations? Did you look outside the Navy uh, as you made these oh, changes? Oh, ab absolutely, and that's a really good question. Um, certainly, I would hate to think that we're so arrogant that, that we thought we had things right. Um, so we began internally to the Navy. We looked across our, our enterprise. Um, and there are some standouts, you know, our Navy nuclear enterprise certainly has a firm understanding of risk uh, and the implementation of risk controls. Um, we also looked outside our Navy to our joint partners, the Army and the Air Force, a little bit different way of doing things sometimes, certainly some opportunity to capture some of those best practices. We also look to our joint partners, uh, specifically the Royal Australian Air Force, and uh, in particular, I think the, uh, the British Royal Navy, uh, who is on its own journey to revise their safety management system in accordance with ISO 45001. I know nobody really understands what I just said there, but that is the international set, uh, standard for safety management systems. So those were military focused, but we're, we're again not so arrogant to think that just because we wear a uniform or our partners wear a uniform that we have all the answers. So we went out to industry as well. Oh, you uh, did, you yeah. went to industry. Yeah, we, went, we benchmarked some, some really high performing organizations like Delta, Chevron, Maersk Line Limited, and all of that analysis yielded a couple of gems. And, and one of them was a, a very solid safety management system, top down, uh, that embraced a culture of understanding the risk that they were operating and communicating that risk and then holding to account the person that was absolutely responsible for eliminating that. Um, all of those entities had that in common. So that became the basis of our thinking with respect to our own safety management system. So I would think some of those companies you're talking about, um, that's some business sensitive information. Yes. Um, 
Did you find them open to, to assisting? And did you find some similarities that you could glean information Abs from? Absolutely. So, you know, when you go out to, to industry, certain there, certainly there is a shared element of safety with respect to occupational safety. Safety, uh, uh, occupational safety like uh, fall protection, confined space entry, we all share that and we were able to glean some of their best practices in, in those elements. And they tend to, beyond the occupational safety aspect, talk about risk in a little bit different terms because really it's financial risk. Um, so there's a little bit of translation that has to happen there. And they also are very concerned with their credibility, as, as we should be. Um, because when a mishap happens in their industry, not only do they lose money because of that in many shapes, ways, and forms, uh, but they also suffer a credibility hit. So although they talked about risk in slightly different terms, the concept uh, of identifying what that risk is and then communicating, as I talked about, absolutely uh, a straight line between what they do and what we do. So you mentioned you went to the other services, Army, Air Force. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned our, our warfare communities a little bit. We actually have two questions here from the audience that deal with each of those, deals with the other services uh, and deals with the, the, uh, the, the submarine community and service community compared to the, avia the aviation community. Um, so take it where you'd like. Um, how, 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 what did we learn from them? How do we compare with them? Uh, are we in this together kind of thing? Uh, did you find a lot of similarities, did, did a lot of differences? Yeah, I think, you know, specifically talking about the, uh, the Army, the Air Force, and the Coast Guard. So I, I am part of a Joint Service Safety Council with the Chiefs of Safety for all the services. And we have a great ability to collaborate on best practices, on lessons learned. Certainly we have shared platforms. For example, the H-60 is shared uh, amongst the Navy, uh, the uh, Coast Guard, and the Air Force. Uh, and the Army as well. So um, we have great collaboration going on there. I, we're all very much aligned, um, but there are different challenges, you know? So for example, one uh, very interesting challenge, and this is also a challenge facing the Marine Corps, is that um, uh, culturally in the United States, our young, uh, young uh, students aren't as uh, welcoming uh, uh, to get a driver's license. So wh when I was growing up, you know, you took your sick, you played hooky on your 16th birthday and went down and got your driver's license. That was a level of freedom and, and we all embraced that. That is not the case anymore. And I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's bad, it's just different. So now, uh, for example, the Marine Corps, 25% of recruits coming into the Marine Corps don't have a driver's license. In, a, or in an organization, that relies heavily on motor transport. Our Army is facing the same thing. So it's just really interesting the, the problems that we each face, sometimes you know, different problems, other times the same, but we're all working together to solve those things. So the Navy or the, the Marine Corps and the Army are working together on that issue. Do we need to re realign MOSs? Do we need to take a look at requirements? All those kinds of things. It's just interesting how evolutionary changes force us uh, into action. Um, I'll take that second part on the culture because that's a great question. I get that quite often. Internal culture to the Navy. Yeah. Um, and, and because I am who I am and I work for who I work for, which is sailors and Marines, I'll include the Marine Corps in here. Um, and the question is, a aviation has its own culture. The, the submarine community has its own culture and the SWOs have their own culture. Um, you know, what are the goods and others, et cetera, et cetera. Why is that culture not, you know, better than, you know, and, and I avoid all that. I, I absolutely avoid all that. We have tribes in the Navy and Marine Corps, and we've got to acknowledge that because there's mm -hmm. goodness there. Mm -hmm. There's different kinds of risk associated with each of those communities, and they've each developed their own uh, 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 way of dealing with those risks to keep people safe and to protect our materiel. Um, but broadly, what CNO is trying to drive for is a culture of learning. So self-assessment, self-correction, self-improvement, and this continual do loop 
that, that you know, moves horizontally across time so that we're all learning. And it doesn't need to be uh, isolated to a particular community. We should all be learning from each other. So a great example is uh, one thing that aviation has used for many, many years is the plan, brief, execute, debrief. Well, that's been brought over to the surface side to, for great effect. Um, and that's not to say that um, there are other elements within our communities that can't, we can't leverage across the force. So when I, when I, when I hear the question about culture, I kind of smile inwardly a little bit. Yeah, we have different cultures. We should embrace that. But we shouldn't be afraid to learn from the rest of the Navy as well. So culture of learning. You mentioned a term earlier, uh, the learning to action board. Yeah. Um, I think that term's new to a lot of our audience. Or maybe I've just been out for a while now. But uh, what is a learning to action board? What's that function and what, what is that? Why do you do that? Yeah, so let me, I'll start with the problem statement. And I think that will inform kind of the answer to that question. The problem is this. We have a mishap or an event. It doesn't have to be a mishap. We have a mishap or an event where there are lessons learned. Okay, so the causal factors lead to lessons learned. And we have a whole long list of these things that we need to change in order for that thing not to ever happen again. So we all go about our work. And then the next thing happens and we go, mm -hmm. oh, look at that bright blue butterfly. I'm gonna focus on that. Mm -hmm. And nobody is tracking the enduring effect of the changes that we put into place. So I'll, let me tie this back to the safety management system. Uh, if we implement a system where uh, four steps in a continuous feed loop, plan, do, check, act. Plan to do something, do it. Check to see if what you planned and did had the desired effect and then act to adjust fire to get it back towards the intended uh, effect and then repeat. Okay, so that's a feedback loop, a very simple one. Um, and that's what we inconsistently uh, applied in the Navy. We, we would get the planning right and the doing right and we often would fall short with respect to the checking and the acting. So the learning to action board is the way that we're going to address how do we assess whether or not the changes we made were effective and are they enduring. So it's a very high level board. It sits at the echelon one level with a lot of different data streams coming in uh, to inform where there's risk in the fleet. That can be command investigations, JAGMANs, uh, inspector general reports, um, uh, other, other inspections, et cetera, et cetera. Gets all this information, builds a picture of risk, and then sends the Naval Safety Command out to spot check to see whether or not the changes that were made in, in fact are having the desired effect and are enduring in nature. Uh, so that's what the Learning to Action Board does. It's really kind of a, the instantiation of a learning process at a very high echelon to make sure that the changes we put into effect are doing what they're supposed to do. So does a Learning to Action Board uh, happen at the echelon too, or is it also happening at the command level? No, it it's, uh, happens at a very high echelon one level, uh, okay. actually. Um, but that's not to say, so when we go back to the safety management system and uh, the alignment under the safety management system all the way from Echelon 5 units to, uh, up to CNO, um, it's all focused on that self assess piece. So just because uh, a command doesn't have a formal structure of a learning to action board, they do have the ability to self assess. They have the obligation to self assess. Um, and then from that self-assessment, they can make improvements and then continually learn. So that's really how that would work uh, under the safety management system. So you mentioned culture earlier. It's all kind of ties back to culture. And we have a question here from the platform. Um, RS asks, um, can sailors tell their chain of command if there's a safety problem? Absolutely. Absolutely. They should be able to. One of the things that uh, Get Real, Get Better offers as really a mandate is to embrace the red. Uh, and anyone who has listened to the vice chief 
talk about our ability to self-assess and self-improve uh, is all about embracing the red. So we want to get away from your subordinates coming in and briefing me on all the green boxes. Look at what I did, sir. I did this, I did that. I'm so effective here and there. No, we're not having that conversation, okay? I want you to tell me what's not being done. Where's the red and why is it red? Is that you and your internal processes? Because we can fix that. Or is that the system that's not acting in a healthy way to support your processes so th this embrace the red concept is absolutely vital. Um, and I would say that um, there's a term called just culture, which is really important in the, in the safety realm. Um, and it's all about transparency, right? And so in a just culture, you should feel empowered to improve your own environment because that's the law. The law says the Navy has to provide you, this is 29 CFR 1960, the Navy has to provide you a safe environment. And if that environment isn't safe, then you're obligated to speak up. And so that's a little bit of a cultural change in parts of the Navy, right? There are, we've always been very, very independent steamers. And we want to show our bosses that we can do this mission. I don't need your help. Uh, I'm gonna prove to you that I can do it. Da -da 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 -da. What we're trying to drive towards is, no, let's have a conversation about how the system is working. And I don't want you to solve all the problems because some of them I own, but you need to elevate that so that I'm aware of that. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Yeah, and I'd like to drill down more on this thought about just culture, the just culture. And, and uh, uh, you talked about the vice chief uh, embrace the red or, um, and, and, and I wanna touch on that a little bit because you know, the CNO's effort to get real, get better, uh, I mean, it really drives home embrace the red. It, it, when I heard the vice chief, it, the first time I heard the vice chief say embrace the red, uh, we've all had experiences with the vice chief and you don't embrace the red. Um, I mean, that's just not a good thing to do with the vice chief. Most vice chiefs, uh, uh, not personally, but just as organizationally. And when, uh, when Admiral Lesher, the first time I heard that, I, it rang a bell with me. Um, and, and then uh, several months later, when, when I heard CNO talk about get real, get better, it made embrace the red more, it, made it, it gave it a lot more leadership uh, impetus. And it told me that what he really wants to know is come tell me if you have problems. Go tell your boss where you have problems. Don't, as you said, just brief the green. Um, so now you talk about creating SMS, and now you talk about a just culture. Um, so drill down a little bit more on what just means when, you know, the just culture. Uh, what is just, why, why do you say just culture? What? Just as in uh, free from uh, retribution from uh, regarding a conversation about what is lacking in that particular organization's uh, system to keep them safe. So free from retribution, that's really what it is. You ought to feel empowered to go to your boss and say, hey, we don't have this right. Um, and then have that, that honest conversation. Um, and then circling back a little bit, um, that embrace the red, that is not a freebie. Okay, and we need to be very clear about that. That is not a freebie to go tell your boss that woe is me, the sky is falling, and it's all somebody else's fault. No, that is a challenge to look at your own internal processes, self-assess, make improvements, and oh, by the way, during that whole evolution, you're communicating up. But at some point, there may be a barrier reached, a, bar a, a, a risk that you as a commanding officer uh, cannot satisfy. And then at that point, you're obligated to eleva elevate that. You either fix it or elevate it. And, and I think when I heard the vice chief talk about it and my point about don't tell the vice chief, don't embrace <laughs> the rebel vice chief, that's my point, right? Is I think vice chiefs, commanding officers, flag officers, they expect a solution. Yeah. But I think what I heard and what you're saying is, is embrace the red means come to me with a problem, tell me your solution, and and if your solution needs external help, tell me, and that fits into what you're doing as a safety command. No, that's exactly right. 
Uh, that, exactly right. The, as I talked about, it's not a, this embrace the red concept is not a freebie to go, woe is me. And in fact, if we think very shallowly about the challenges that we face, face in the Navy, you could boil them all down into the man, the train, and the equip, right? Yeah. I don't have enough manning to do this training, and oh, by the way, you haven't given me the pieces. So um, it's beyond that. If you start the conversation with that, you haven't dug deep enough in your own processes to understand your problem. And that's the key to the whole thing. That self-assessment part is what exactly is the nature of your problem? Mm -hmm. um, and can you solve it at that level? And regardless of whether or not you can solve it then or not, elevate it. Let the rest, let your superiors know because I bet you that problem's not isolated to that particular ship or squadron. Mm -hmm. I bet you there's something in there that can be aggregated across the force and that we can learn as an enterprise, not just unit by unit. Yeah. So you, you talk about self-assessment and we all, you know, assessments is a key to success, right? And, um, and assessments are a big part of safety center, safety command. Uh, I've got to go here. You, you suspended assessments. Yeah. Um, why, why did you do that? Yeah, there's really three reasons why we had to uh, curtail our planned assist visits. Uh, first and foremost is that in this transition to the Naval Safety Command, we needed, we needed think space in order to get this right. Um, so I had to bring back the teams. Uh, I got some really smart people down there and I needed everybody, all hands on deck, to make sure that we got our processes right. Uh, so that's one reason. The second reason is uh, there will be a shift in what our assessments look like from that assist visit that I talked about Naval Safety Center to the Naval Safety Command. Um, that, those, assi those assessments are going to look different. They're going to look at different things and we need to figure that out. We need to design that so that we're measuring the right things to inform the health of the safety management system, not just reporting on somebody because they're not doing something they should be doing, okay? And then the third element, I think, really has to do with the training. Um, so we're gonna send folks out to do this assessment to look at compliance, and they need to understand what exactly they're looking at. We've never had that level of training, to be honest, at the Naval Safety Center. So we've gotta make uh, a cadre of professionals that can truly assess compliance and then uh, uh, bring that back and exquisitely detail that, uh, those findings and how they inform the effectiveness of the safety management system. So there's a level of inter internal training that we had to do as well. Um, as always though, I mean, if somebody reaches out to the Naval Safety Command and says, I need, I need help, um, regardless of whether or not I got the team in the building working on the design or training, we will send somebody there. We will get them out there to provide that help. Um, so we are uh, always and will continue to be responsive to the fleet. Do, do you see a time where they'll begin without being called on? Um, yes, so we're gonna begin a regular battle rhythm of assessments um, starting in June. Okay. Will be our Echelon 5 unit level assessments. Uh, and the way that's gonna look is we're, we're not going to send people individually to all points of the earth to do individual assessments. We're going to take a cadre of experts, aviation, surface, subsurface, installation, and drop them into a fleet concentration center, and then they're going to scatter and, and go look at the individual units that are there, aviation, uh, surface, sub, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're trying to cross-train as much as we can so that uh, I've got aviation maintainers walking on board ships and they're now able to identify uh, what we need to be working on and, and what we can do better. And I've got the reverse is true as well. Uh, submariners walking into squadrons going, why is that happened like that? You know, so it's really interesting. But that whole process will take place in June. Uh, will got be it. the first uh, instance of that. As far as the uh, slightly higher echelon certification events, what we're trying to look at there Think of your training carrier strike groups, CSGs 4 and 15, mm -hmm. afloat training groups. We're trying to eliminate that variability in performance across the spectrum. Uh, so we're gonna start taking a look at that in July. And then for the upper echelon uh, inspections to evaluate the effectiveness of the safety management system, well, that'll start later in the year. We've got, had to build a uh, whole new directorate 
uh, and provide a whole different level of training for that cadre of individuals, so that'll be slightly delayed. Got it. So we're almost out of time. Oh. I, I, I've got to. I've got to ask you. Um, looking forward, the CNO's been pretty, pretty clear. Um, get real, get better. How do you see the safety command fitting into uh, uh, the safety command's role in this in the future? Uh, really, I think we are. If the way I like to look at it is, you know, get real, get better is an umbrella. Uh, and it's a, a little bit of a simple analogy, but it works for me. Uh, if Get Real, Get Better is an umbrella, we are one of those braces, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and it just so happens that the work that we've been doing at the Naval Safety Center slash Command um, falls uh, very well within the construct that CNO is talking about. So I think we're a little bit out front in that regard. Not, not, uh, that might be a little bit of a dangerous statement. Um, but where do we fit in with respect to Get Real, Get Better? The key is the self-assessment piece and the continuous learning piece. So we want to get reinforce the idea of the value of self-assessment, and that's what our assessments will do. Um, but then the data we bring back from those assessments uh, to highlight where the learning is taking place or not taking place, um, that will provide a clear picture of where the risk is for CNO and then, then that loop all continues again. So I think it fits pretty neatly within Get Real, Get Better. Okay, final question. Every commander of the Naval Safety Center was an aviator. Yeah. How are commanders of the new, and, you, and every commander of the Naval Safety Command to this day has been an aviator. How will commanders of the Naval Safety Command be selected in the future? Yeah, that was part of the design uh, of the, the Naval Safety Command, and, and we, we had long conversations about where we need to go as, as an enterprise and where the Naval Safety Command fits within that. Um, now, there's been an aviator there since 1951, the Naval Safety uh, Activity, and I think it's done pretty well. But what we're doing at the Naval Safety Command is tribe agnostic and we're trying to drive to the point where uh, we can get this continuous learning cycle in motion. Uh, and that really doesn't depend on what tribe you come from. Um, so the requirement for the future commanders of the Naval Safety Command will be that they be a two-star and that they have some expeditionary strike group or carrier strike group leadership experience. Uh, but that's it no longer an aviator. So I think it offers great potential to bring new perspectives uh, into uh, our problem solving um, uh, endeavor. And uh, you know, it's, uh, it's the way of the future. So that's the plan. Yeah. Can you tell us who the new guy is and how yeah, that's going to happen? Yeah, I will, I will. Um, and I'm actually quite pleased to have this conversation, uh, not because I'm leaving, because um, I absolutely love my job, but the, my follow-on at the Naval Safety Command will be Rear Admiral Chris Engdahl, who is currently mm -hmm. Expeditionary Strike Group 7 Commander out in Japan. Uh, so that means he's coming with that Expeditionary Strike Group Command experience in the most compelling environment if you're a Naval officer. Um, he also has experience as a, uh, the former president of the Board of Inspections and Surveys. Mm -hmm. So tremendous uh, uh, experience there. He also just happens to be a really good friend of mine. We both served at the Navy Personnel Command back when we were uh, 06s. Uh, he is a extremely intelligent uh, individual, and I think he's gonna bring a perspective that, oh, by the way, he's a surface nuke. So that brings a different perspective to our endeavor, and I think it's gonna be valuable. Really looking forward to having him on board. Well, Admiral Luckman, thank you very much. This has actually been a great sit rep. Um, I really appreciate the, uh, the update on the safety command. And I think our audience is focused on, the, uh, on, on safety at sea. And, and you know, again, we, we hear sometimes about the big ones, but we don't know what's going on day to day. So thank you very much. Any closing remarks, any thoughts as we wrap up? No, just to say thank you for this opportunity. As you can tell, I don't mind talking about my business. That, you know, I find so much passion uh, in, in in, in trying to ensure that our sailors and Marines are safe every single day and that every day they go home to their families. So thank you for the opportunity. 
Well, thank you. Thanks for your time. And, and I, I have to tell you, uh, thank you for everything you've done in those 4,000 hours and 1,000 uh, carrier landings. Uh, but clearly the, the passion you have uh, for the men and women who serve in our in our sea services is is uh, is clear, and I I am convinced you could talk about this for a couple <laughs> more hours. So uh, thank you very very much for what you've done in a great career in the Navy. Thank you, Frank. And thank you for joining us here on uh, on the sit rep. As I said in the beginning, we've got a, uh, a long list of uh, events coming up. We're back open. Uh, the summer is coming, so this, the spring events are, are, uh, are coming. We're doing more, we'll have more sit reps coming up, some pretty uh, continuing good topics, good, good uh, hosts. Concerts on the Avenue are going to start around Memorial Day. Uh, movies on the Memorial will start around Memorial Day. We'll have a Memorial Wreath Lane to, uh, to honor those men and women who, of the sea services who have given their lives. And then the Lone Sailor Award Dinner. Uh, is going to happen in September, and we're great, uh, proud to announce that on September 27th, we will air the Lone Sailor Awards program. We're going to continue that tradition of having an online, progr online program. So before we wrap up, I want to again thank Navy Mutual Aid and Dell Technologies for your sponsorship. We couldn't do what we do uh, without their support, and I want to thank you all for joining us. Thank you for your interest in our Navy, and thank you for tuning in today. Until the next time, fair winds and following seas.